grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A few years ago, there was a story that came out about a gentleman named Norwood Thomas. Thomas was, at that time, in his mid-90s. And he had served as a paratrooper in World War II. He was stationed in England, London specifically, and one night while he was stationed there, he looked across the River Thames, standing on the bank of the River Thames looking across, and he saw a fetching young lad by the name of Joyce Durant. And it was one of those moments, he says, where he instantly fell in love with Joyce, saw her, and was just smitten with her right away. Got to know her. And during the time that he and Joyce were stationed in London, she was a nursing student, and they just clicked. One of those amazing things that happen. Two people see each other, and instantaneously, they just get each other. And Norwood and Joyce couldn't get enough time with each other. And so they spent every waking moment that Norwood wasn't doing military activity, Joyce wasn't doing nursing, and they spent their time together. That is, until... June 6, 1944, when Norwood, along with 150,000 plus other Allied troops, stormed the beaches of Normandy to liberate France and ultimately Europe from the bonds of Nazi, Nazi grip. After the war, Norwood and Joyce lost touch with each other. They weren't able to reconnect after the war. And so Norwood was shipped back to the United States. Joyce went back to her native Australia. And as was the case back in those days, letter writing was the way that you stayed connected with people. And so they wrote letters back and forth constantly. And in one letter that Norwood sent, he asked Joyce to marry him. Imagine that. Think about that these days. You are halfway around the world. And the best way you can think of to still tell the woman you love that you love her and that you want to spend the rest of your life with her is to write a letter to her and propose marriage to her. The sad thing about it is Joyce said no. And the problem with what Joyce had read in Norwood's letter, something about the way in which Norwood had composed that letter left Joyce with the impression that Norwood had actually found someone else in the States. And what Joyce thought Norwood was saying was that he wanted to marry this other woman. And so there was a misunderstanding, and she wrote back to him and said no, she wouldn't marry him. And it was all based on a tragic misunderstanding. Ultimately, what ended up happening is Norwood settled down, got married, was married to his wife for 56 years before she passed away, and Joyce moved on with her life. She married a guy who was married to him for 30 years, living separate lives. A few years ago, Joyce decides to ask her son to Google Norwood's name. Just curious, whatever happened to Norwood? And so her son Googles Norwood's name, in part because Joyce has now become almost blind. She finds it difficult to navigate the internet by herself. And sure enough, there's a guy who matches Norwood's description. He's living in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And that Google search ended up turning into a Skype visit. There is a picture of those two seeing each other for the first time. And of course, a Skype visit, while better than letter writing from 70 years before, wasn't going to cut it for these two. And so a crowdfunding drive was set up. They were able to raise enough money to get two first class tickets. And all of a sudden, after 71 years, there they are. It's laughable, my friend. Two people who fell in love during one of the worst times in our world's history. You guys know these stories. Back in those days, folks would tell you, because they didn't know what tomorrow would bring, once you found somebody that you loved, that was it. You got married because you didn't know what tomorrow would bring. And yet, because of a misunderstanding, they would spend seven decades apart, and yet, because of the blessing of technology, and because a lady said, I don't know, just look them up. After seven decades, these two were finally reconnected, and they were able to spend 
about nine to ten months together. We're back to the book of Genesis this morning that we were on on Wednesday night. And where we left off on Wednesday night in the Garden of Eden, today we pick up in the book of Genesis. And God has now said to Abraham, look up at the stars in the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And God had said to Abraham, so shall your offspring be. God had given Abraham an amazing promise that even though Abraham was getting up into his seventh decade of life, that God was going to make sure that out of Abraham and out of Sarah would come descendants as numerous as there were stars in the sky. And a couple of chapters later, God reinforces that this is the promise he has planned for Abraham and Sarah. He says, I will bless Sarah and surely give you a son by her. She will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Twice. God has made a specific promise to Abraham. Twice, God himself has spoken to Abraham. Abraham didn't get this from a Google search. This was God talking directly to Abraham and saying, this is my plan for you. And there was a problem, though. Because that second time that God said to Abraham that he was going to make a nation out of him and Sarah... Abraham responds, and he fell face down, and he laughed, and he said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of ninety? It's laughable. Folks, we don't have a single person sitting here this morning who's a hundred years old. And yet you have to be that old before God tells you for the second time that you're going to be the source of all the descendants that God has for his people going forward. Yeah, right. And in, as we pick up the lesson for today, God's promise gets even more specific. And for the third time, God comes to Abraham and Sarah to reinforce the promise that he has for them. Of course, as you know from the story, this time there are three angels, three servants from God who are traveling Abraham doesn't know exactly who they are. They're visitors, and so he does what any good person in that day and age would do. He acts in a hospitable way. He invites them in, prepares them food, makes them comfortable out of the heat of the sun. And at that point, one of them says to Abraham, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Third time, God has made this promise. And what's the response? Sarah overhears what this person is saying. She's standing behind a curtain. She's been helping get things ready. And she hears what's said. Now you understand that she and Abraham have had these conversations over the years, right? This isn't the first she's heard of this. But the problem is that she and Abraham have had these conversations over the years, and the years have ticked by. God has made the promise at least twice to Abraham she and Sarah, he and Sarah have sat down over dinner and talked about this, and they're getting older. And yet again, the promise comes for a third time. And when Sarah overhears it, what's her response? So Sarah laughed to herself and thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Tick tock, tick tock, time's wasted. Sarah's 90. Abraham's 100, and you're going to have a kid. Right. Do you mean to tell me that God is going to create an entire nation? God is going to create the descendants of his people out of two people who are carrying ark cards. Next, tell me that two lovebirds from 1944 are going to be able to reconnect and spend their closing days together 70 years later. Sure, happens all the time, right? It's laughable. It's comical. It's unbelievable. And yet, just as we were on Ash Wednesday, we're back in the book of Genesis, and we're back with a problem that Satan throws in front of us all the time. Just as we talked about on Wednesday, Satan's four words that he first uttered to Eve 
are the same problem that Abraham and Sarah run across 19 chapters and hundreds of years later in the book of Genesis. Did God really say? Did God really say that he was going to make his nation out of you two people? Did God really say that he was going to take two senior citizens and make his descendants out of those two? Yeah, he did. Guys, he said it at least three times. And yet the response is what? Left. God says it at least three times, and his servants can't help but go, but come on. It's laughable. God can't possibly do that. And so what God does is he takes Abraham aside at the end of our lesson for this morning, and he says to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you, not the angel, I will return to you at the appropriate time, at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Did God really say he was going to make that happen? He did three times. And then for the fourth time, he reinforces to Abraham directly and says, I will be back here at this time next year, and Sarah will have her own kid. In his most famous hymn, Luther wrote a lyric that we're using as the basis for our Lenten season this year. Let this world's tyrant rage in battle will engage. His might is doomed to fail. God's judgment must prevail. One little word subdues him. And of course, that hymn is Satan. And that one little word, as we talked about on Wednesday night, most completely that one little word is Jesus. But what God has done through all of his 66 books of his word, is he has sprinkled in single words which themselves have the power to put the devil in his place, to subdue the devil and make sure that we, as God's children, know exactly what God is capable of. And that is always that whatever the devil threatens, the devil can't ultimately do. Because God will always trump card the devil in what he does. And so how is it that a word like laugh can subdue the devil? The bottom line, my friends, is the devil doesn't want us to believe God's promises. God promised Abraham and Sarah four times what he was going to do. Yeah, but did God really mean it? That's the problem, my friends. The devil doesn't want us to believe God's promises. Has God ever not fulfilled a promise he has made. No. Every promise that God has ever made, he has delivered on completely. It may have taken time. Amen? It may not have fit according to our understanding of when God should work. But then again, when are we in the business of telling God when and how he should work, right? But God has always delivered 100% of the time on the promises he gives. And the problem is, we tend to put limits on God and say, yeah, but God, you promised it, but it can't be. It's too unreal. The means by which you want to work are too impossible. That is precisely, my friends, what the devil wants. The devil wants us to take God's promises, even when he said it four times, and to go, yeah, but it can't be. The other thing, too, is the devil wants us to disbelieve God's ability to do what he says. Four times, my friend, God said that Abraham and Sarah will have a son, and Sarah will have a child. You guys know how the story goes, and you can't blame Abraham and Sarah for it. But they can't believe that God is going to use the means that he does, so what ends up happening? They think to themselves, well, what God must mean is that Sarah is supposed to have a child by her servant Hagar. And so, Hagar is going to kind of be the mother, the surrogate, and sure enough, that's what they try and do. They have Ishmael, right? And what ends up happening? God goes, nope, not what I meant. No, Sarah, you're going to have the kid 
You, not through a surrogate. This is what the devil wants. He wants us to disbelieve God's ability to do what God says through the means God chooses. Save the world through a guy who dies on a cross. Ha, ha, ha. Can't work. Sure it can. It's the only way. And so this is the other problem, too, is the devil wants us to do that. The devil wants us to laugh at the impossibility of God being able to do what God says he wants to do through the means he wants to do it. And yet, what does God do with that very same word? Satan wants us to laugh at God in disbelief. And what God turns around and does is he uses that very same trait in human beings as the way to subdue the devil. Really? You had a kid through Hagar? No, 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 no. What I meant was Sarah's going to have a kid. And by the way, here you go. Oh, no, 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 no. You want to be made right with me, and you can't hold up your end of the deal. Here's Jesus. 33 years of walking around. This is how God wants things done. Crucify him, we say. And we did. And on that Friday, we thought we got rid of him. <clears throat> Oops. Didn't work out that way, did it? God turns the laughter of disbelief and he turns it into laughter of joy. He uses this to show the devil and us what he can and he will do. God cannot be thwarted. God cannot be overcome. And so what does God end up doing? Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Amen? There it is. What does that look like in our day? Kara, thank you. Fantastic job of showing the kids this morning how God used some very, very unexpected people in Scripture to do exactly what God planned to do. These are not the kind of people that you would have thought God would have said, I'm going to do incredible things through Jonah. Nope. Kara showed the kids today all these examples in Scripture of where God takes the impossible, and makes it possible because that's what God wants to do. But what does that look like in our day? How is God still doing that in our world? I've mentioned this before. When I was, at, when I was in college, I went to St. Olaf. And back in those days, I don't know if they still do it, but they required that every student show that you could complete three semesters of a foreign language. You had to take 101, 201, and 301 and pass in order to be done with your requirement. I took 101 German, tanked it. Terrible. <laughs> in fact, weirdly, the only verb that I still remember from German is the verb for to smoke. <laughs> I don't smoke. <laughs> Thank you, that was 1984. <laughs> I took first level Spanish. Got by by the skin of my teeth. Took second level Spanish. Didn't do so well. Took first level Spanish again. <laughs> Didn't do so well. Took second level Spanish. And my professor said, you know, Andrew, we're noticing a trend. <laughs> and it's not a good trend. So for my 301 level, they put me in a special class. <laughs> I'm not kidding. A special classroom where they said, look, all you have to do to complete this requirement so we can get you out of here in time is we're going to put you in a class where you're going to study French literature. You're going to do it in English, but you're going to study French literature. I show up for the first day of class, my second semester of my senior year. I need this class to win, right? I walk in, and there's me and one other guy sitting there and the professor. And the professor walks in, and she goes, you know, with only two of you, Maybe we shouldn't have this class. I'm like, yeah, we should. <laughs> so I asked Brad if he'd stick around and come to class. He said he would. Two of us in this class. Guys, foreign language. Not what God gave me gifts for. When I was being created up in heaven, the foreign language gifts were completely avoided by me. <laughs> so I get done with college. 
I work in business for five years, and then all of a sudden the Lord puts it on my heart, hey Andrew, let's become a pastor. Okay, great. What's the requirement? Hey, have I got a deal for you? <laughs> you get to go to Luther Seminary, and the first thing you get to study is Greek. <laughs> and your first semester, at least I was able to take the first one-on-one level Greek during the summer, all by itself. I did okay. The first semester that I'm in seminary, you know what they got me taking? 201 level Greek and 101 level Hebrew. <laughs> Guys, I couldn't handle one foreign language. And now you got me taking two? This is a recipe for disaster. And what ended up happening? I was blessed with a Hebrew professor who was truly one of the most godly men I've ever met in my life. Wendell Frerichs. And Professor Frerichs helped me get through what was impossible for me. Guys, you guys know the old Byerleys over here in Roseville? Yeah, midnights on Tuesdays, I would be sitting there studying flashcards in Hebrew, hundreds of them at the time, trying to memorize Hebrew. I got through. Guys, what's strange today is that as we sit here today, every week I still use Greek and Hebrew. Those of you who are joining us for our Tuesday Bible studies, Every week, I'm using foreign language. Me. Me. Using not one, but two foreign languages. Guys, you laugh. Why? Because it's laughable. I shouldn't have gotten through that. And yet, because God is faithful, because God said, I don't know, this is what I want, he makes it happen. Lee Strobel. How many of you guys know about Lee Strobel? Lee Strobel worked for the Chicago Tribune for 14 years as an investigative journalist. Lee Strobel was married to a woman named Leslie, who shortly after they got married, a woman in their apartment building started to talk to Leslie about Christian faith. And Leslie was interested. Here's the problem. According to Lee, Leslie was a lot of fun. They did all kinds of fun things together. And then Leslie started getting interested in this Jesus Christ character, and he got concerned because Lee Strobel was an atheist. And Leslie was turning into a holy role. So what Lee Strobel did, investigative journalist for a Chicago newspaper, what he did was he spent two years going around and interviewing Christian church leaders with the intention of showing that Christian faith is a bunch of malarkey. After two years, what ends up happening? Not only can he not disprove that Christian faith isn't real, he was moved to Christian faith. Lee Strobel now is one of the most articulate people who argues in favor of Jesus Christ that the Christian church has. It's laughable. You had an atheist who went on a two-year crusade to try and disprove Christianity, and ha ha, God changed his heart. And he now is a modern-day Paul, if you will. God literally turned his heart 180 degrees. He's one of the strongest people to argue for the reality of Christ in the world and the faith in which we all subscribe. If you want to subdue the devil, my friends, what do you do? You laugh at. God has said, I'm going to do these things. Satan wants you to say, it's impossible and laugh at God. And yet, if you want to subdue the devil, what do you do? You let God use your laughter. You laugh at Satan's lies. You laugh at Satan's limitations that he wants to put on you. And the God who wants to work through you, you let God take that laughter of disbelief and turn it to joy. You let God take that laughter of disbelief and use it to undermine the devil's efforts to do what it is that the devil wants to do to take you away from faith in Jesus Christ. Laughter. This is one of the things that God uses. This is one of the words in God's holy words that God uses to undermine the devil. Because this is ultimately what Sarah said. God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, and yet 
I have borne him a son in his old age. To God be all glory. Amen.